who am I? I'm Ben Newman. I work for Meteor. Um, I can be found on social media using the handle Benjamin without an I. That's not a typo. Uh, I have also had the privilege of being a delegate to the TC39 JavaScript Standards Committee um, in the last two jobs that I've, I've worked. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, something really exciting that they did mostly before I joined the committee. So I want to be very clear that I can't take credit for this, um, but I am excited to explain why it has become my favorite feature of the new version of the language. And if after this talk you're not convinced, that's great. Uh, please come give me your impassioned defenses of your favorite features of ECMAScript 2015. I'd love to hear it. Um, but mine is modules, or more specifically, the import and export syntax. Okay, so these slides are just a web page uh, on github.io, Benjamin without the i.github.io slash empire node 2015. But first, let's, let's talk about not modules, but eval. The mere presence of eval in a function, or so we're told, thwarts almost any kind of optimization or static analysis. V8 will just give up uh, on compiling that function down to efficient machine code. Most JavaScript programmers that I know consider eval more harmful than goto. Uh, it helps that goto is not part of the language and eval is. <laughs> Heaven forbid a snippet of user input should end up in a string that got evaled. So just, just as a baseline, um, I hope you've all heard of eval before, but in case you haven't, it's a magical function that takes a string and runs it as if it were code you had written in place of that function call. So it's super powerful, um, and the problem with user input here is it's a, a walking cross-site scripting attack. Um, anyway, can clarify that later if, if there are questions. And uh, more to, to my concerns, there's no good way for transpilers like Babel or Tracer to support eval, so they just don't. So we've kind of, as a community, left eval behind and decided that it's really never acceptable to use this super powerful feature of the language, especially if there's any other way to solve the problem that you think it might be useful for. And yet, we actually use eval all the time, in spite of what we say. It hides behind a lot of different abstractions. It goes by many different names. Uh, there are script tags with sources loading arbitrary URLs. That's eval. That's taking a string and executing it in your JavaScript environment. Script tags without sources. There's the capital F function constructor. There's the node version, which is uh, the VM module has a run in this context method, which takes a string and runs it. And then there's all sorts of uh, HTML oddities. Uh, you can put JavaScript colon URLs in the hrefs of links and invite users to click them. Uh, buttons can have on-click handlers. Even set timeout, although this has begun to be forbidden, uh, used to be able to take a string as its first argument instead of a function, and that would be evaled. And this is important. Uh, it's important that we be able to run code somehow uh, in JavaScript, right? It's an interpreted language. Uh, the source starts out as a string, not as bytecode or machine instructions, and we've got to do something with it. And eval is that crack through which we get everything uh, that, that we do with, with Node or JavaScript. Um, so as the, as the poet Carl Sandburg pointed out, nothing, nothing happens unless first an eval. And if uh, Leonard Cohen is more to your taste, there's an eval in everything. That's how the code gets in. So there's no escaping eval. Uh, <laughs> as unusable as it may be, as harmful as it may be considered, you gotta use it at some point, but it can be tamed. And the reason that I started this presentation talking about eval is that I think Node, and this is a conference all about Node, right? does this taming better than any other JavaScript platform. And that is largely because of CommonJS. And CommonJS is the module system of Node. CommonJS is great. All your code runs in a specific module scope. Any given module runs at most once the first time you require it by passing its module identifier to the require function. 
module source code uh, doesn't get loaded from just anywhere, arbitrary URLs or script tags, but from static files on the file system, uh, which are found according to simple rules. That's a link. Uh, if you look at the slides later, you can follow it. Module load order just falls out of this process naturally. Uh, when you require something, if it's the first time it's required, that's when it loads. Module exports remain distinct, so there's no more competing over the global namespace. And so the global scope stays clean. All these things are great. And the singular feature that I want to point out is that thanks to Node and CommonJS, once all the setup has happened and the, the environment is, is sort of ready to go and your code starts running, you and only you, not some script tag or an HTML page or someone else's JavaScript, get to make all the decisions about what additional code is allowed to run and when. And that, that sense of control, that precision, is what makes the VM dot run in this context, which is essentially an eval that happens you know, way under the covers in Node, feel okay and not like radical overkill. So has CommonJS won? From the perspective of Node and NPM, I think the answer is yes. Uh, most people in this room who write Node have used CommonJS and are familiar with it and wouldn't think of using anything else. So my task is to convince you, perhaps, that, that it might be a time to consider another approach. But what about code running in web browsers? Because let's be honest, that's still the vast, vast majority of code. They're still using global variables and static JS files that have nothing like a module system embedded in them. And it kind of pains me to ask this question whether CommonJS has won. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but uh, other languages don't have popularity contests like this. They just have module systems built into them. So it's, it's kind of a shame that we're, we're using this terminology. And we always have to ask, even if we think we've won, uh, in the midst of our triumph, can we do better? So what's wrong with common JS? It's great, but what's wrong with it? Well, there are four problems as I see it. The first problem is how code is loaded. And this, granted, works great for Node. It just asks the file system and loads code from the file system synchronously, but that doesn't work so well uh, when you need to do hundreds of synchronous HTTP requests over the network. That's just a total non-starter, so of course, there has to be a way to deliver bundles of code to the client to somehow anticipate what the client is going to need and make sure that it's already there by the time that it is required. Um, and this topic by itself deserves an entire talk, um, but there's a, a long, impassioned, brilliant rant by Trek Glowacki uh, all about that that you should, you should check out. I wish, I wish that this talk could have been about that, but I'm gonna make it about something else. So the second problem is a thornier problem CommonJS allows you to have cycles uh, in your dependency graph, and that's cool. Um, that actually is useful. Uh, so here's some relatively real-world code in a file called wrap.js and another file, file called log.js. And you'll notice that both of them require the other one on, on their first line, so that's, that's not really gonna work. Um, you can imagine a main JS entry point that requires one of them. Uh, in hopes that they can sort out their differences somehow. So what's wrong here? Well, main requires wrap first, and the first thing that wrap does is require log, and the first thing that log does is require wrap, and that works. Uh, you get back an object um, that is the, the exports object, if you know what that is, uh, from the wrap module, but uh, since we only got as far as requiring log in wrap.js, that wrap object does not yet have this wrap.deferred property. That's gonna happen on the next line, but it hasn't happened yet. So when we try to wrap our logging function so that it, uh, I guess, what did I want this to do? Uh, sets a timeout and like logs it a little bit later. Maybe there's a performance problem with, with logging synchronously, who knows. Um, that wrap.deferred is gonna be uh, an undefined property and you won't be able to call it as a function. So that's definitely a problem. But I think we can fix it. So we're gonna take the require from wrap and move it down to here so that we don't require log until we've defined the deferred function. And now, according to Node's rules for resolving uh, dependency cycles, by the time log requires wrap, 
uh, that deferred function will be available. The logged function, which happens after the require in wrap.js, won't be there, but it doesn't matter because log doesn't use that. Um, so it seems like, uh, at least for the time being, we've fixed this problem by moving our require down to the middle of the file, which is a weird thing to do, but you do what you have to. So why does this work? Uh, hope I just explained that. Will it always work? Uh, let's put on our maintainability hats. And just imagine that the main JS file, um, instead of requiring wrap first, decides, oh, logging, that's a cool thing. I wanna, I wanna log that I'm starting the server before I actually start it, and that's a reasonable thing to do. But now, the load order of these two files has flipped because something out of both of their control, the contents of the main module, has changed which one of them is the entry point with respect to the other, right? So what happens now? And uh, you can be forgiven if you don't spot this bug immediately. Uh, it's pretty subtle, but this kind of thing creeps in and bites you in large code bases that use common JS if you have any cycles in your dependency graph, right? So if I can explain this in a few words, um, since we're requiring log first, the first thing that happens in log is that it requires wrap, and that's great. It, uh, wrap gets the chance to de define its deferred function, but then wrap requires log, and log is already being evaluated, right? And so the rule about that is we get back its exports object right away without any further ado, right? And remember where we were in log when we required wrap. We were at the very beginning before we defined any exports. So that require dot slash log in wrap is gonna return an empty object. And so the, the log property that we're trying to get off of it will be undefined, and we won't know about that. Like everything will be fine until the first request comes into the server. And then that request will call into the function that was returned by uh, the, the logged wrapper. Um, and we will try to use that log variable and find that it is undefined and uh, somehow not a function. Wouldn't it be great if undefined was a function? <laughs> okay, so this is like a downstream problem that uh, is only sort of like easy to explain because this is such a small example. And in large code bases, you end up with dependency cycles by accident and their, their consequences are nasty. So um, there are ways of making this work, uh, but I don't wanna go into that right now. I just wanna point out that it's a problem and it's a problem that's affected by this issue of load order, right? So it's great that CommonJS allows cycles, and it's great that their resolution policy is relatively simple, but what works one day can stop working the next day just because some piece of code elsewhere in the code base changed, and that's not great. Okay, so here's an example uh, from the React code base, which I had the chance to work on, uh, where we gave up on modularity and just merged two modules together because we decided we didn't want there to be any cycles. So that's not a great solution either. If you just say no cycles ever, um, then you end up just kind of losing the benefits of a module system. Uh, there's a link there if you wanna dive into that. So cycles can be useful, cycles should work, um, but they are not without their problems in common JS. The third problem is this issue of the exports object versus module.exports. Um, and I think I'm going to gloss over this except to say that Life would be a lot easier if the only way of exporting things in Node and CommonJS was to assign properties to the exports object. But as you may know, you can also reassign module.exports to any arbitrary value, and then whatever you had put in the original exports object um, becomes totally irrelevant. So that's also not great. The fourth problem, it may seem like we're returning multiple things when we add properties to exports, and that's nice, uh, it works you know, that's, that's how we do it. Uh, but it's nearly impossible for any kind of static analysis to look at the code that requires a module and determine which of its properties were actually used. Um, and that's not a huge problem on the server because you have all your code there. You just, uh, you don't really care about dead code because it, it sits there inert, unused. But client bundlers like Browserify and Webpack end up including tons of dead code because for all they know, everything could be used. Okay, so that's kind of more of a missed opportunity than a, a specific like flaw in CommonJS, um, but if we could move in the direction of uh, making static analysis easier, that would have a lot of benefits. 
So one answer, as in many situations, an answer that has never worked for me, is you could just impose a certain discipline. You could say maybe, we'll never assign to module.exports unless, unless we're really certain that that module has no circular dependencies at all, no dependencies um, is, is safe. Uh, and then instead of immediately trying to grab a property from an imported module, um, you should always just require the module and store a reference to its exports object and then use, in this case, a.foo later um, instead of just foo, right? Because then a.foo has a chance of being defined by the time you use it, whereas foo is just always a snapshot of whatever you imported at the top of the file, right? So neither of these is bulletproof, but one has a considerably better chance of working. And if you stick to that discipline, then you might well save yourself from all of these problems. Uh, but there's just nothing about common JS itself that particularly helps you or your teammates keep this discipline. So while common JS may be the most popular module system that we have, um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's a shame that we're even talking about it as a popularity contest. Other languages have built-in module systems. And the key point here to notice about how they've done it is that most of them provide a special syntax instead of uh, trying to implement the module system as part of the standard library. Because of course they would like their standard libraries to be written in the language itself and take advantage of modularity and you wouldn't be able to do that if the standard library also had to implement the very module system that it was using. So if we had a native module system with special syntax, um, then that would really greatly ease cooperation between authors and consumers of libraries. They'd both be speaking the same language. They'd have no choice. It would eliminate the need for each library that wants to ship a bundle of code to provide its own module loading system. You'll notice at the top of any Browserify or Webpack bundle, there, there's like a uh, dead, uh, simple um, mechanism for, for implementing require and exports. Um, but you wouldn't even need that if it were part of the language because it would just be something that the language handled for you. A native module system regularizes the structure of applications. People talk about Python's significant white space and Go's strong formatting conventions as advantages because it means that when you look at someone else's Python or Go code, it looks just a lot like your code. And if we had a module system, then the part of your code that imports and exports stuff uh, for other modules would be immediately familiar and not um, idiomatic. And perhaps most importantly, if we had a native module system, it would allow the developer community to stop debating the merits of different code sharing mechanisms. We have better things to do, like whatever happened to that blink tag. Let's see if we can get that back. Okay, so a language without a native module system is, and this, this is the worst part of it, a language in which no one is ever quite sure how to share their code with the widest possible audience. If you bet on the wrong best practice, um, it might be CommonJS, might be AMD, it might be this universal module definition, it's a recipe for obscurity. Uh, and if you revert to the simplest common denominator, which is just defining global variables, that feels like giving up. You lose all the advantages of modularity, and you, you force that situation on people who want to use your library. So that's why I think the new ECMAScript 2015 import and export statements are so vitally important. A native module system would be a huge relief, even if it was worse than CommonJS, even if it was more restrictive than CommonJS, just because it would be part of the language. For instance, the Go module system just forbids circular dependencies. You can't do it. That's one solution. If you don't like it, don't use Go, right? Um, at least there's no debate. No one wastes time uh, talking about that in issue trackers for projects that happen to be written in Go. But in fact, and this is the good news, the IS 2015 module system was designed with all the strengths and weaknesses of CommonJS in mind. And thanks to the hard work and cleverness of people like Dave Herman, another TC39 committee member, uh, ES 2015 modules solve or at least mitigate all four of the problems I was talking about earlier. So, how does it work? So at first glance, uh, if you're familiar with ES 2015 destructuring, uh, which is another cool feature, 
An import statement looks a lot like a destructuring variable declaration, right? You might just require the file system module and then have an object destructuring pattern that grabs the read file and write file properties. That looks pretty similar to import with the same, literally the same syntax from FS, right? This, this seems way superficial. So what's the difference? Well, consider this usage example. Contents are not that important except that it uses read file and write file. Let's think about the destructuring version. If you know how that works, it's basically just like grabbing a snapshot and uh, storing those functions and variables. Um, it's a lot like the problematic example earlier where we grabbed foo too early. It has all the problems of that earlier example. But what about the ES2015 version, right? Does it do anything different? Well, yes, fortunately. What actually happens behind the scenes is that only a reference to the module is imported and it's stored as a unique temporary variable. Or you could imagine it being stored in that way. This is how Babel might implement it, but not necessarily how a native implementation would do it. And yeah. then all the references to those imported properties get rewritten, right? And this is really cool because it means that with the S2015, this ensure trailing new line function always gets the latest version of read file and write file. And that's not just useful for resolving circular dependencies. There's a very popular, I mean like 600,000 downloads a day, uh, package on NPM called GracefulFS by Isaac, the node guy, um, where this would be great. Uh, it's a drop-in replacement for the file system that turns all the asynchronous versions of its functions uh, into versions that respect the, the global limit on the number of open files, which seems like a, a super niche thing, but when you run into it and you can just fix it with this module, um, it's, it's great. It's great to make problems disappear forever, right? And uh, this graceful FS module started out by trying to patch the actual file system module, but that didn't work because it couldn't be sure that it was the first code to run. And there might be other code that was still using the original versions of the functions and there was nothing it could do to enforce the, the limit on the number of open files after that, but if everyone had been using ES2015 import statements, it wouldn't have been a problem because then GracefulFS could patch the file system module and everyone would start using the new thing. Okay, so uh, what about module.exports? Uh, I am going to gloss over this in the interest of time, um, but it uh, suffices to say, I hope that modules can define a default exported value um, and then you import that uh, without using curly braces, as in these first two lines in the DJS file. Um, but if you want to import named properties, you use curly braces, and so there's no longer any conflict between exports and module.exports. Um, you can just import uh, the, the default thing as well as the named things, and they uh, work well together. So you might even say, thanks to this live binding of module imports and the uh, harmonizing of, of default and named exports, that ES2015 modules enforce the discipline that I outlined earlier, which means, and this makes all the difference, that it doesn't have to be self-discipline. What about multiple exports? Well, this is pretty cool too. Uh, no longer are we exposing the actual exports object um, when you import something using ES2015 modules. Um, we know what all the names are of things that were exported uh, from the module that you're importing. And import statements have to give the names of the things that they care about um, in the syntax of, of the import statement. Um, so that most importantly makes it possible for a static analysis to determine um, which of those imports you're using, which you're not using, if you try to use one that was never defined. Um, and a really good uh, bundler could take advantage of that information uh, to let you require only or import only a few functions from the underscore library, say, and then have the rest of the library removed behind the scenes and not shipped down to your browser. So that's really cool. Um, since I haven't been able to give a detailed explanation of even part of the import and export syntax, here's a link to a very detailed explanation of, of literally every aspect of it by Axel Rochmeyer. Um, Rollup by Rich Harris is a tool from the future, let me tell you. Um, when most people say that their tool is next generation, they just mean it came after the thing that they don't want you to use anymore. Um, Rollup is so 
from the future that uh, probably won't work with your code today. But what it does is so cool that you will want your code to work with it. Um, it basically does the static analysis that I was just talking about and figures out, uh, based on your imports in this main JS, uh, that you're only importing cube. And in maths.js, Rich Harris is British. Um, you definitely need the cube function, right? But you don't need the square function anymore. So the bundle, the output, includes only the cube function, which is pretty cool. And the, the consequences of that are, are just hugely dramatic, like uh, bundles of fourth the size of something that Browserify or Webpack would give you. But you have to be using ES2015 modules and only ES2015 modules, which is uh, why this is a little bit uh, futuristic. So enough about the future, you probably are wondering, and I was asked last night by some of the other speakers, how can you use ES2015 modules today? Uh, more people would be doing, if it, uh, doing it if it were easier. Um, and I'd love to tell you, because I, I work at this company, just use Meteor. Um, that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but uh, that will soon be the case. I'm glad to say that. Until Meteor 1.3 is released, and we're on 1.2 right now, I've put together a skeleton NPM package that has nothing to do with Meteor, that you can clone and modify or just use as inspiration. Um, let's see if that'll load. Yeah. Right, it has a source directory where you put your ES2015, a lib directory where things get transpiled, and a test directory that runs Mocha tests on both of them and compares the output. Um, so it's, it's pretty dead simple. It's not a working application, but you can run the tests um, and modify it, see if you run in, into any dead ends in the way that I've set that up. But it's, it's my opinion about how you might set up a basic project that uses ES2015 modules, and I hope it's helpful. If it's not, um, and it can be fixed, please submit pull requests. Okay, so some stuff you can do with that is write ES2015, transpile it, run Mocha tests, and here's the key. If you take nothing else away from this, this talk, um, what I would love to see happen is that people no longer put their source directory in their NPM ignore files. I want you to start publishing your ECMAScript 2015 code um, to NPM so that NPM becomes a repository of JavaScript of the future as well as JavaScript of today. And hopefully, while there will be still people who want everything to just work and just want you to give them a, a bundle of JavaScript that they can run in a browser without modification, tools like Rollup can begin to work their magic. And that's really important for the future that I want to see and I hope I've gotten you excited about here. So if you try that skeleton package uh, and apply its conventions to your projects, I hope that soon you'll be publishing both ES2015 and CommonJS to NPM. But what about those people who just want a JS file that they can load with a script tag? There's a whole discussion here, and I said I wouldn't talk about it, but there's really no good way uh, to bundle code, either at publish time or at install time. Uh, if you do it at publish time, then you have to build in a bunch of dependencies, and they might overlap or even conflict with other dependencies and other bundles. But if you do it at uh, install time, then any errors in the bundling get displayed to the consumer. So that's no good either. Um, and still others will say, and this used to be a naive hope, but it's becoming more and more of a reality, if we could all just use the same language for writing modules, then our bundling tools would have a much easier job. And this is not a great situation, even, even today. There's, there's a whole talk in here um, that I certainly don't have time to give. But it does give me a segue to sing some of the praises of Meteor. Meteor has a build system. You use Meteor, you buy into it, um, and as long as that's cool, it takes care of pretty much every aspect of bundling for you. In fact, only binary dependencies, if you're writing a package and publishing it, need to be published for multiple architectures. We also use an optimizing constraint solver. It's nothing like just throwing raw CS at a problem um, that's actually compiled from C++ to JavaScript using mscripten. Um, I guess the output is asm.js. Talk about the future. Um, to ensure compatible package versions. So the whole problem of conflicting dependencies is just disallowed in the system thanks to this constraint solver. And Meteor will support ES2015 modules in the next version if I have anything to do with it, and I have everything to do with it. 
No, seriously, if you don't see it in 1.3, you'll know that I didn't do my job. All right, so again, my pleas. If I've convinced you that ES 2015 modules are great, and I hope I have, for your own sake, I think you should start writing them sooner rather than later, and I'm happy to help answer questions about how to do that. You don't need to use a funny file extension. ES 2015 is just JavaScript. Publish your source files to NPM in addition to common JS files so that sophisticated tools can begin making use of them. And this is really important, but a subtle point. In addition to the main property that tells NPM and Node where to find the entry point for your compiled code, also include a JSNext colon main property in your package.json that points into your source directory so that um, the tools know where to look for the original files. That's, that's really important. And, you know, the name may not end up being JSNext colon main, but it's cheap to add additional properties to your package.json file. All right, and better yet, uh, if you think all of that's a good idea and you want to help me submit automated pull requests to every node project on GitHub, find me after this talk. That's my, my contact information. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Ben, come on over here. Let's hang out for a sec. Over here. <laughs> Sorry, okay, I'm just gonna ask you really quick questions, quick responses. Um, they want their coffee and snacks. Okay, name a movie that made you cry from laughter. Um, Dr. Strangelove or Show. Okay, very good. Favorite lyric to any song ever? Oh. <laughs> That's sweet. Okay. Uh, favorite Disney character? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Favorite app? Does Meteor have an app? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a really good one. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. <laughs>